In Exodus, the second book in our Bibles, Moses asked God, what are you like? Now, we all have a picture in our minds of what we believe God to be like. In your imagination, you think you know what God is like, and you may be right, or you may be, yeah, wrong. It all depends on where your picture of God comes from. If it comes from your own imagination or from pop culture, then you do not have a correct picture of who God is. You've got to go to the source to discover who God is. And in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, God tells us who He is. In the first week of this series, we learned that God is a person, not a human like us, but a relational being someone who wants to be known by us and relate to us. In the second week of this series, we learn that God is above all other beings, both seen and unseen. He's above all else in all of creation because He's the one true Creator God. And He has a name, Yahweh, to distinguish Himself from any other little g gods. And then last week, we learned that God's primary character trait is that He is compassionate, and gracious. He feels compassion for us, and He acts on our behalf. He's merciful toward us. He's like a merciful father, a merciful parent who cares deeply for His children. Now, what will we discover about God today? Well, let's read Exodus 34, 6 and 7, and let's do this out loud together, wherever you are, out loud together, and we'll discover what God is like. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now let's read the very first part out loud together again, Exodus 34, 6. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. Do you believe that about God, that He's slow to anger or that He's just ready to zap you at a moment's notice? Well, He's not. He's slow to anger, but that also means He does get angry. God's wrath, His anger is very real. Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, uh, Psalm 7, 11 tells us, God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day, every day. Because he's an honest judge. He's a just judge. And then Psalm chapter 5, verses 5 through 6 says, The arrogant will not stand in your sight, for you hate all who do evil. You will destroy those who speak lies. Yahweh despises violent and deceitful people. God hates, God despises people. I thought God is love. Well, Notice who God hates, the wicked, and those who lie, and those who are violent. Imagine the con artist who rips off the elderly person, or the corrupt politician or bureaucrat who abuses their position, the date rapist who gets off scot-free, the pedophile. You know, when people say, I just can't believe in a God of wrath, I, I say, yes, you can. Every time you read about a child that's sold into sex slavery, every time you hear about another act of senseless violence committed against a totally innocent person, every time you find out the government has lied to you or hid corruption, every time you read about rape or murder, you think to yourself, this is not how it's supposed to be. And you're right, it's not God's will. There's no secret conspiracy, not really. There are evil spiritual beings and wicked, evil human beings, and they are at war with Yahweh. So there's violence and there's <clears throat> wickedness on this earth. Yahweh has a plan to work all this mess into good, but he still feels the agony of war. Remember, he, he's a person, so he has feelings and he feels anger over all the evil and sin in this world. There are times when the healthy, emotionally, spiritually mature response to evil is anger. It's okay to be angry over the right things, but you and I, we have to be really careful with this. 
Because a lot of times our anger comes from a, the source of a wounded ego. Somebody slights us or someone uh, lies about us or someone uh, <clears throat> gossips behind our back or somebody won't do what we want them to do. And so we get angry. So we do have to be careful because a lot of times our anger comes from selfish motives where God's anger is never selfish. God's anger is the heart of a father toward a son or a daughter who are doing something self-destructive and in the process hurting others. And his anger is always directed at all forms of evil. However, anger is not God's starting point. Like we learned last week, God's starting point is compassion and mercy. And because of that, God is slow to anger. Now, we live in a culture that's very different from the culture that the Hebrew people around Mount Sinai, when they first hear these words from Yahweh, lived in. In their culture, the gods and goddesses were angry and they could fly off the handle at a moment's notice. So when Yahweh says, I'm slow to anger, that's life-giving to them. The problem in our culture is that God has often been recast into a God who never gets angry at anything. You know, what's the most well-known verse in the Bible? I'll give you a moment. You type it there in the, in the chat, in the comments, and then, then we'll see if you get it right. All right. If you put John 3.16 down, you got it right. For God, and it's a great verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But what's not quoted so much is John 3.36, which says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. So it ties right back into John 3.16. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the yeah, wrath of God abides on him. Our God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, but there comes a time when God's patience does run out. Now, last week, we talked about Nineveh and how God changed his mind, and instead of destroying them, he spares them because they repented. They stopped their wickedness and their evil, and so God spares them because our God is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. However, the Ninevites return to their wicked ways fairly rapidly, but God is slow to anger. So he patiently waits for 150 years for them to repent again. Instead of doing that, what they do is they end up going and destroying, completely conquering and destroying God's people in the northern kingdom of Israel and dispersing them westward. And it's at this point that God's response to the Ninevites is anger. It's recorded in Nahum, a prophet of God. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Yahweh is a jealous and avenging God. Yahweh takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. Yahweh takes vengeance against his foes. He is furious with his enemies. Yahweh is slow. So he's quoting Exodus 34, 6 and 7 here. Yahweh is slow to anger but great in power. Yahweh will never leave the guilty unpunished. When God says enough is enough, his wrath is revealed in two different ways. Active wrath. For example, at the beginning of the church, <clears throat> God strikes dead a husband and wife for lying. You can read about that in Acts chapter 5. That's active, immediate wrath of God. And that's the kind of thing that people who say <clears throat> they don't believe in God like to complain about on the internet. But that active wrath of God is actually very rare in the Bible. Most of the time, God's wrath is passive wrath. Now, don't get this confused with being passive aggressive. That's not how our God is at all. Passive wrath is when God gives us what we say we want and removes his blessing and protection from us, and that's the judgment. For example, in the case of Nineveh, God removes his protection and blessing from them and allows another world power, Babylon, to completely destroy the city. God didn't actively destroy the city himself. The Babylonians do. 
Now, to bring this into our personal lives, God's passive wrath is when He doesn't act to keep us from the effects, the results of evil. It's when God says, well, have it your way, and He takes away His protection and His blessing, and He allows us to experience the consequence of that. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome about God's passive wrath. In fact, uh, this was last week's next step, so you might have already read this passage from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, where Paul describes God's passive wrath and the resulting downward spiral to personal and cultural bankruptcy when we turn our backs on doing what is right and good and not obeying what our God says to do, and we just do what's right in our own minds. Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and the result of that is God gives people what they lust after, what they think that they want, and that's uh, never good. God removes His blessing and protection, steps back and says, well, okay, just go ahead and do whatever you think will make you happy. (laughs) It'll never make you happy, but God says, go ahead, and your body is racked with alcohol and drug addiction. You get fired from your job for stealing. Your country becomes divided. Your marriage is wrecked by an affair. For example, we think God's wrath is when somebody gets caught in an affair. That's not God's wrath at all. That's God's love. That's God's mercy. God's wrath is when nothing bad happens to you and you think you're getting away with it, whatever the sin might be, which a lot of people believe. They believe they're getting, hey, I'm sinning. Nothing's happening to me. I'm getting away with it. And then what happens is their heart gets so warped out of shape and gets so hard, it doesn't even recognize what goodness is. It doesn't even recognize what truth is. It doesn't even recognize what true love is. And we see this happening in our culture. Many have no idea what love really is because love is being redefined as, let me do whatever I want. That's, that means you love me if you just let me do whatever I want. And that's not love at all. And tolerance is being redefined as well. Tolerance used to mean that you and I could disagree on something, but we didn't want to kill each other over it, and we still respected each other. Now tolerance means we're good if you totally agree with me. That's our current cultural definition. But the truth is, to disagree with someone does not mean you don't love them. My wife and I disagree at times, but it does not mean we don't love each other deeply. But in our culture, to disagree means you hate. I mean, just try saying, I disagree with your viewpoints on sexuality and gender, and no matter how gracious and compassionate you are, you'll immediately be labeled hateful or worse. Or just mention our current president, and you don't even have to say his name, and you'll be called intolerant. You know, I will not tolerate your intolerance. Now, I'm just a guy who grew up on a small ranch in Idaho, but isn't I will not tolerate your intolerance intolerant? Chanting peaceful protest, peaceful protest while I'm throwing a rock through your window or shoving you or punching you in the face somehow makes it not hateful? You know, silence is complicity. I I, I think we're seeing God's passive wrath happening in our country right now. So Yahweh's wrath is present, future, active, and passive. Now, I haven't talked about present future yet, but I will right now. Most of God's wrath is either present passive or future active, meaning one day God will act and and put an end to evil forever. But in the meantime, God's way of dealing with sin is usually to step back and allow you, allow us to suffer the consequences. It turns out that sin is its own punishment and obedience is its own reward. Now, love, at least the the love Jesus talks about, 
it often leads to a proper anger. And this is the kind of anger we see in Yahweh. His anger is just, it's unselfish, and it comes from the place of love. Anger that comes from a father who cares about his kids and cares about his creation. And since Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh, we should see the same kind of response from his life, slow to anger, but he still gets angry. There's a pop cultural myth about Jesus that he's just all about all-inclusive love with no boundaries, and that's just not true. Jesus talks about God's wrath and coming judgment a lot. Mark summarizes Jesus' message as this. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Jesus talks a lot about the need for personal and national repentance. Repent and believe or put your trust in the gospel. A couple of stories that really capture the essence of who Jesus is, Yahweh in the flesh, show us He's slow to get angry, but he does get angry. One happens at the beginning of his ministry, and the other happens at the end of his ministry, but they both happen at the same place, the temple in the city of Jerusalem dedicated to the worship of Yahweh. Here is the first time it happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple complex, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple complex with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Now, Jesus has been to the temple numerous times before this day. He's slow to become angry, but he does get angry. I mean, he sets down and he makes a whip. He throws the temple money all over over the place. He overturns tables, and no one does anything to, to try to stop him. That's the kind of power Jesus has. Now, why is he so mad about what's happening here at the temple? Well, the Jewish priests, the Jewish spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they're supposed to be shepherding and helping people follow Yahweh, worship the one true Lord. But instead of doing that, they're hurting and they're abusing Jesus' sheep, and that makes him angry. In fact, it ticks him off. Here's the kind of things that they were doing. Say you brought a lamb to sacrifice at the temple for your sins, because this is before Jesus, and you would sacrifice a lamb for your sins. And you brought a really good lamb, a perfect lamb, because that's what Yahweh said to do. But you get to the temple, and the priest who inspects your lamb says, "Mm, you know, this is a good lamb, but it's not quite good enough. But good news, we have a lamb that you can purchase that's been pre-approved, and you can purchase it for the low, low price of, and they would sell it to the people at a rip-off price. Or say you brought money to give to the Lord. Well, they would say to you, well, we can't accept that dirty American money, or no, actually the Roman currency at that time. We can't accept that dirty Roman currency. You've got to give only temple coin. And so they would have you exchange your Roman currency for temple coin, and in the process, they would charge you an exorbitant rate to exchange the money. For example, say you wanted to give the Lord $1,000, they might charge you $1,500 for exchanging your money, and they're pocketing that $500. So that's the kind of stuff they're doing, and that's why Yahweh, that's why Jesus is so upset, and he cleanses the temple at the beginning of his ministry. And his preaching and teaching ministry, they last uh, three to three and a half years. And during this time, he would have gone back to the temple many, many times to see, have they repented? Have they changed their ways? And they don't. He's given them three years. He's slow to anger. And he knows the second time 
He's going to cleanse the temple. It's going to lead directly to his crucifixion. But it doesn't matter. He's angry at their corruption, at their sin, at the injustice. And so here's what happens. This is right before his crucifixion. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13. Jesus went into the temple complex and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of thieves. Jesus' love and anger are not at odds with each other. God's anger flows out of God's love. It's because God is love that God gets angry. Now, God's primary character trait is love, but an attribute of God is anger, and He responds in anger to sin, to hurt, to injustice. And Jesus' actions in the temple are a preview of what's to come. There is a coming day when King Jesus will put all things right and everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God and God will wipe away all sin, all injustice, all evil. He's patient. He's slow to anger because He doesn't want to destroy. He wants people to be saved through faith in Jesus. And you will not survive judgment without Jesus. Only in Jesus can your sins be forgiven. James, Jesus' brother, writes to us, the 12 tribes dispersed, and he says this in James chapter 1, verse 19. He says, remember this, my dear friends, everyone must be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. Then toward the end of his letter, James writes, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Therefore, brothers, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Don't get caught up in some cycle of revenge. God will judge your ex-spouse, your horrible neighbor, crooked and perverse politicians, violent people. James continues, Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord, and now James quotes Exodus 34, 6, The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, let's bring this to us. Are are you patient? Are you slow to anger? And if the answer is no, I want to pray for you. I I don't want you just trying harder. I want Jesus' Holy Spirit to fill you and change your life from the inside out. So I want to pray for you right now. Holy Spirit, Jesus, we need your healing. We need your freedom from our past. We need the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. So give us your power so that we can be like you, slow to anger. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.